The epic Fletcher-class destroyers of World War II. Fast, powerful, and deadly, these warships were the backbone of the U.S. Navy's destroyer fleet, feared by their enemies and revered by their crews. With speed, power, and cutting-edge technology, they fought in some of the most intense battles of the war, from the Battle of the Atlantic to the Pacific Theater. These ships served with distinction, taking on enemy submarines, aircraft, and surface vessels. They played a pivotal role in securing victory for the Allies. Today we will take you on a journey through history, exploring the incredible stories of these awesome machines and the courageous sailors who manned the Fletcher class destroyers. All right, thanks for checking out the Steamship Mafia. My name is Ken Stano with YouTube channel History X and HistoryXChannel.com. Tonight we've got another special episode of Museum Ship Mafia for you tonight because it's a, another live bro uh, crossover broadcast where we celebrate the 80th anniversary of the commissioning of one of the four remaining Fletcher class destroyers on the planet. Tonight it's going to be the USS Charette, which eventually became the HS Velos. Uh, which is now on display in Greece. Uh, people helping me tonight. Uh, we're going to bring a few people on board. We've got Shane Stevenson from the <laughs> Buffalo Naval Park. Are you all uh, checked in and ready to go? Absolutely, Ken, as always. All right. And then John Epp from the USS Slater in Albany, New York. John, are you all uh, dialed in? I am ready to go. All right. Um, and then, uh, helping us out tonight, we've got Connor Kilgore, who is one of the admins from the Facebook group, the Museum Ships Facebook group. Uh, he is also a volunteer for the Alexander, Alexander Henry Icebreaker in Thunder Bay, Ontario. We're going to drag him on in a little bit, but he's pulling the levers and spinning the dials for us in the background. If you guys have comments, if you have questions while we're going through this tonight, Connor's going to be the one that's going to be. Uh, arranging the questions, possibly supplying some answers. So just want to let you know that he's going on in the background. And of course, like I always say, tonight, any night we do Museum Ship Mafia, we cannot do this without subscribers and viewers watching us do our thing. So if you have questions, comments, throw them up in the comments section and we will get to them. Let us know where you're watching from. Which YouTube channel are you on? Are you on History X? Are you on the Buffalo Naval Park? <coughs> are you on the USS Slater? Let us know where you're watching. Tell us where you're from. What's the temperature over there? That type of thing. Um, oh. All right, Shane. Yes. What is the latest from the Buffalo Naval Park? Sure. Uh, so the latest is... There we go. Uh, uh, <laughs> there it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the latest is, you know, our season is up and running. We're so thankful that uh, the Canadian border has been opened now fully because we really l like uh, that we we usually get about tw 12,000 to 14, 15,000 Canadians that visit us. And so for the past three years, we have not had that. So uh, we've really seen an uptick, uh, you know, We've seen an uptick in Toronto Blue Jays uh, jerseys coming on board and uh, used to get the Toronto Maple Leafs jerseys on board. Not so much now. I just have to give a little dig to the Toronto Maple Leaf fans out there, if there are any. Uh, and so, yeah, we're, events are, you know, we're getting ready for Memorial Day. Uh, we just did a World of Warships uh, that I participated in a couple hours ago. Uh, and so there's really a lot of energy and movement. Uh, today we had about uh, 50 volunteers from a local bank doing some work on the USS Little Rock, and they come back tomorrow, and uh, they'll be doing some more work, scraping and painting and things like that. And uh, so we're thankful to these. We're really uh, upping our volunteer game to match, say, the USS Slater, uh, the USS Kid, and other uh, museum ships. So. 
Well, and, and before we get to the the Slater, let me ask you this. What is the deal with the world of warships? You said you had something going on today. What what was that all about? Yeah, so the the world of warships is a gaming platform, if you guys don't know, and hopefully everyone knows. And they do the what's called the longest night in the museum. And so they are working with, I think it was, they said, 23 museum ships around the world. And there is a video, it's either live or pre-recorded, that goes 20 minutes, a half an hour. And then they do a 15-minute live session Q&A after the, um, you know, after the, uh, after that video. And so uh, I did that about 6 o'clock to about 6.45 or Eastern Standard Time. And then the the USS Cod was on right after us. So okay. I watched a little of uh, good old Paul for race in uh, Cleveland. So, yeah. And we've had Paul on uh, before I think yeah. it was last year. Yeah, yeah. We had Paul on. Uh, let's see. All right. They have a YouTube let's... channel going now, by the way. Who's that? The Cod? The Cod. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. We'll have to check really? it out. Really? Excellent. What's the, uh, what's the latest going on with the Slater, John? Uh, yeah, season is underway. Um, what two weeks now? Uh, two weeks ago, we had our spring work week, very successful despite the the, uh, the rain on almost every single day. We had roughly thirty volunteers from around the country, some as far away as Seattle, Washington, come on out and live on the ship for an entire week and just work on a bunch of projects. Um, Frank, who's in chat right now, he visited the Buffalo Naval Park on his way out to the sea this later. <laughs> And Go he, uh, he stayed on board. Yeah. Um, uh, that's about it. We don't really have much going on right now. We are just, uh, ooh. I don't know when our next live stream is. I I, I don't quite remember. But, um, you mean for Museums at Mafia? Or, yes, for June. But uh, this is the, the second weeks. Wednesday. The second Wednesday. The second Wednesday. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll talk about it again then. Uh, in, in exactly two weeks from today, we'll be having our. Um, death cell final reunion uh, in Albany. So that's, that's all we got going on right now. Well, and I saw on your Facebook page, you know, when you always talk about the volunteers, I'm always amazed at the turnout you get for volunteers at the Slater, but you even had uh, a picture of one of the guys installing a, uh, uh, a cryptograph machine. Uh, oh, that yes. Uh, so we have uh, an electronic, electronic cipher machine on loan from the NSA museum. Um, it's mm. the, the cipher machine that would have been used on, on most warships during World War II. There's only a few left in the world. And, I should have um, grabbed a picture of it not. to put up here. It was, it was pretty it's, cool. It's, it's very cool, yes. Yeah. The code was never broken. But um, uh, hmm. 20 years ago, our director, Tim Rizzuto, they were stripping uh, the USS Clamp. I believe it was in California. And he saw the safe for ECM. And he knew what it was immediately. But we did not have the machine, so he he grabbed the safe regardless, and it's been sitting in our wardroom for twenty years. We finally <laughs> have something to put in. So yes, yeah. I love it. He grabbed he grabbed the safe. Uh, well, so for those of you that aren't aware, um, the uh, the USS Slater obviously they have their YouTube channel. Check out uh, you can search for them uh, USS uh, Slater on YouTube, but uh, they also have a very active Facebook page. Uh, just search for USS Slater, and you're going to see all kinds of the volunteer activity up there. So it's a uh, it's pretty cool, pretty cool stuff to check out. Uh, let's see here. I wanted to, um, I want to drag Connor on real quick. Like I said, he's he's working for us behind the scenes, but at the Alexander Henry, and of course we had Connor on. I want to say in February, telling us all about the Alexander Henry. So uh, he's helping us out behind the scenes, but. They just went through a rebranding. Mm -hmm. What was that, Connor? Was that yesterday or the day before? When did you guys? It was yesterday. It was yesterday. It was yesterday. Okay. So it, I thought this was pretty interesting because I'm always a fan of, um, you know, if a museum ship's been doing something, for, you know, the same thing for the last 30 years and it's not relevant anymore, then you got to just reboot and mm -hmm. so I liked seeing something like this. Why, you know, take a few moments and tell us what you got going on. Uh, well, I did kind of talk about it during our show back in uh, 
back in February. But basically, we have rebranded uh, now officially. Uh, we were known as the Lakehead Transportation Museum Society, uh, but we are now known as the Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay. And hmm. the reason behind this was because the name Lakehead, uh, our region hasn't been referred to as the Lakehead in 53 years now on any official documents. So at this point, uh, if someone's coming to the city for tourism, they're looking for things to see in Thunder Bay. Uh, so uh, they're looking for that. And uh, they were finding us because we were still called Lakehead, which was, while it's a very cool name or it's a name that's been around for a long time, it is not relevant to the modern tourist industry in our city. So we decided to rebrand, uh, but keep the transportation aspect because our goal is to eventually represent all aspects of transportation. Right now, the Henry is really the only thing we have. So we only really have the sea and a little bit of the train covered, but we still have other stuff to do. But uh, that's where we're kind of saying that this is our goal for the future. Uh, this is what the name we're going forward with. <laughs> So it's still going to be www.tmtv.ca, correct? Yeah, www.tmtv.ca. So, yeah, so for those of you that aren't aware, Connor Kilgore, one of the volunteers at the Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker, Alexander Henry, which is on display in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Check them out, www.tmtv.ca. And as I said a little bit ago, you can also come across Connor. He is one of the admins of the Museum Ships Facebook group. 60, yeah. 70,000 followers. It's a pretty active group, so I highly recommend you check them out. Um, okay. Yeah, anything else you want to add? No, uh, I'll let you get back to your Fletchers <laughs> and I'll continue controlling things behind the scenes. Uh, but I wish everyone here a great 2023 season. <laughs> because we're just starting next week. Yeah. Well, all right. Yeah. Get to work. Same to you, Connor. We're shutting you down. Uh, let's see. All right. I, I got to I gotta say, though, right? What's that? Uh, Hulk Hogan's tights have, has been asking for these hats. All right. Uh, these are ones that we got in uh, Iowa. All right. Okay. But we have them now for the Buffalo Naval Park. And so they have the DDG 68 and the DD 537. The five gold stars. So these are now, I think they've just been added to our gift shop. So I think uh, that will make Hulk Hogan's tights pretty happy, hopefully. And uh, for anyone else, this is a, this is a beautiful hat. So I had to say that. Just so anyone's aware, Hulk Hogan's tights is one of the uh, <laughs> followers, subscribers to the Buffalo Naval Park. I, I believe that's what the story is behind that guy. Um, yeah, or, yeah. He's involved with us, you know. All right. Well, let's see. So uh, tonight, like I said, at the opening, we are going to be talking about the 80th anniversary of the commissioning of the USS Charette, which eventually became the HS Velos. Uh, this is actually a pretty cool logo created by Park Stevenson, who we're going to be bringing the guys on from the kid in a little bit. Uh, there's a picture of the, uh, the Charette, which eventually became the HS Velos and is one of only four Fletcher class destroyers remaining on the planet. And it is somewhere, somewhere over in, in Greece. So John Epp is going to be taking us through that. Uh, let's see. And I want to now, a lot of moving parts to this, but I want to now get the guys from the kid up here. So I'm going to be pulling up Tim and Parks. Let's see. All right. So there's Tim and <laughs> there's Parks. Hello. All right. Park Stevenson and Tim Nesmith of the uh, USS Kid. Are you guys uh, all dialed in? Ready for launch. Excellent. Uh, let's see here. So um, Tim Nesmith, uh, ship superintendent at the USS Kid. Park Stevenson, who is the... Uh, Museum director at the kid, is that correct? Am I getting that right? Something like that. All right. Um, this guy, for those of you that aren't aware, not only is he the uh, uh, director of the USS Kid, um, he's also been making appearances uh, through all the BBC outlets. And I, this is just, a, I'm sorry, it's an unfortunate picture, but I, I grabbed this <laughs> screenshot of Parks 
doing an interview with the BBC, uh, one of many interviews with the BBC about the latest news oh, about yeah. the USS, or I'm sorry, about the HMS Titanic, the um, the 3D rendering that went on. So how many interviews did you do? Uh, as, <laughs> as the sun has gone westward around the planet, I've been picking up everything from UK to the US, um, had Argentina today, Brazil later tonight, uh, Australia, uh, I've got uh, New Zealand later tonight. Uh, I've got a revisit with CNN on Saturday when I have duty aboard the ship. That'll be fun. I'm I'm all interviewed out. Uh, between, yeah. Between Tim painting the hole today and me on constant interviews, I've done over 20 interviews in the past couple of days. Wow. Um, we're, we're, you look exhausted. We are exhausted. <laughs> we are exhausted. Yeah. I am so tired yeah. of staring into this camera and talking to virtual <laughs> people. Um, you have no idea. Well, I wasn't going to say anything, but leave it to John to actually point that out. Um, and I also want to thank Connor for pointing out. I called it the HMS Titanic, and he actually corrected me. He said it is the RMS Titanic. So that was uh, that was my mistake. Only when she's carrying mail. Otherwise, she's SS Titanic. Oh, yeah? RMS was the designation given to her to carry the royal mail. If she wasn't, uh, and that gave her special privileges, docking privileges, things like that. And if she was not uh, carrying royal mail, um, she was just a steamship, Titanic. No kidding. Oh, well, she only had one voyage, and she was carrying royal mail, so RMS Titanic. <laughs> Good point. She did only have one voyage. And uh, let's see. So uh, Tim was uh, painting the... The hole. Side the ship. Yeah, you you were painting the hole. So what's what, what do you guys have uh, coming up real quick at the uh, the U.S. Kid, USS Kid Veterans Museum? Well, uh, painting, painting, and more painting for me and and the guys working with me. Uh, this week we have had nothing but tours, you know, school tours wrapping up end of year field trips, um, overnights, uh, Memorial Day is coming up. Uh, we'll be open. We usually years ago we had a memorial service every year for that uh department of veterans affairs is located right down the street from us so they've kind of taken on the pomp <clears> and <throat> circumstance of the of the ceremonies we just stick with some educational stuff um we have a memorial plaza with all louisiana natives killed in action from the american revolution to modern day uh engraved and granite in a courtyard and so we've collected over the years maybe about 100 150 photographs of these people uh, with some basic information and we taken their they're printed out laminated photographs of them with information on the back and hung by dog tag chains and we hang those up outside the museum building right outside of the exit or the entrance for the memorial plaza and people come by and see those and it puts a face to the name and kind of tells them a little bit about the person. And uh, every year we just remind everybody we would love to get all 7,000 names, mm. all 7,000 pictures. Right now mm. we're only around 150, but anybody who sees it and knows one of the folks and has access, we'd love to to add them to the collection. And where would they uh, would they submit that through uh, USSKid.com? Yes, they can go to info at USSKid.com and, and let us know they've got it and they'll put a, put them in touch with the right person. We'll tell them, you know, what kind of DPI we need on the scans for the pictures so that they won't fuzz up, pixelate. Um, and what kind of information we're looking for, really any kind of information about them. Just it makes it more applicable to somebody. Oh, he played football in high school. I played football in high school. And it, it draws connections, makes them real. Connor threw the uh, the website address up there a little bit ago. Again, USSKid.com. Of course, thanks, Connor. And then, of course, you can also find their YouTube channel, USS Kid Veterans Museum. Simply get on YouTube and search for USS Kid Veterans Museum, and you'll check out uh, their channel. One other thing that I wanted to mention about the kid and uh, did this uh, last month. There is, if you're on uh, History X, if you're watching us on History X tonight, there is a donate button in the lower right hand corner for any kind of donations you want to throw uh, the way of the kid. They are looking at getting into dry dock just like the USS Sullivan's is. So check out that donation option. You can also throw your support behind them at their website, USSKid.com. 
when we were on last month, I mentioned this once. There's all, but there was already a, a round of donations, a little over a hundred bucks. So if you want to support what the kid is doing and preserving that ship, definitely uh, click on that donate button. One hundred percent of the proceeds from YouTube go right to the USS Kid. So they would definitely appreciate your support. That's why. And when they come to the USS Kid, those funds go directly to our maintenance supports. So that's uh, it doesn't go <laughs> in anybody's pocket. It goes right to our uh, our vendors. Right now, it goes to the paints paint company. <laughs> yeah, because I'm sure paint's not cheap for all you guys. Paint uh, is insane nowadays. Yes, oh my yeah. gosh. Uh, and then the uh, the last representative of the Fletchers, uh, I want to bring up Buzz from the USS Cass and Young. We had Buzz on. I want to say it was March. And let's see. There he is. Hello. Hey, Buzz. All right. So we tried to we tried to bring Buzz on last month when we were talking about uh, the commissioning of the kid. Unfortunately, we had some internet issues. But looks like you're working tonight. I'm working off my phone. I had the same problem, so I got a hold of tech support, and I have the wrong browser on my desktop. You guys uh, were all breaking up the. Uh, the pixels were going crazy, so I shifted to my phone. Gotcha. Well, we're we're glad to, glad you did that. We uh, we're glad to have you on. Um, like I said a few moments ago, we had Buzz on back in March. Uh, USS Cass and Young. What's going on with uh, the Cass and Young over there in Boston? Uh, I've been reminded, first thing I have to say is I'm not speaking for the National Park Service or the U.S. <laughs> government in any fashion. This is uh, Buzz as part of the Friends of the Cass and Young. Friends of the Cass uh, and Young, got it. Yep, yep. Uh, I got reminded, so anyhow, um, <laughs> we've got uh, several new volunteers coming aboard. Uh, we've uh, been told by the, uh, the park that they're actually starting to... Uh, make the blocks for our next uh, dry docking, which would be somewhere four to five years. Wow. Well, that's, so everyone's tr looking to go into dry dock at some point. Um, well, the ships are 80 years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's actually a really good point. You know, these, these ships, 80 years old, as we've learned in the past when uh, we've been talking about when the Sullivan's came, you know, started taking on water, the hull only three eighths of an inch thick in places. That's when it was new. That's when it was right out of, well, right at commissioning. 80 years takes a toll. And the Cass and Young sits in salt water. So I'm sure you guys have a lot to deal with there. Yeah, I just tried to show you a picture of the hull from the last time. Let's see if I can get it up in front of my face here. Let's there's see. a piece and there's the thickness oh. of the hull. Oh, well, you can kind of measure it against my nose. That was the thickness <laughs> when it was new. I mean, you know, so in 80 years, there's a lot of deterioration that goes on there. Yes. Definitely. Uh, let's see. So as, as Buzz pointed out a few moments ago, if you want to check out the Cass and Young, Friends of the Cass and Young on Facebook. And uh, that's the best place to find out what the latest is going on with the Cass and Young, correct? Yes, we try to post something every time the volunteers are aboard, which is uh, Tuesdays and Saturdays. Got it. All right. Well, we're here today. We've got all these guys from the uh, the Fletchers around the world on here. A lot of, like I said, a lot of moving parts, and they're all on here today because we are talking about the commissioning or the 80th anniversary of the commissioning of the USS. Is it the charrette? Is that the proper pronunciation? I believe so. Yeah, that's, okay. that's how yep. I say. Got it. And the charrette after World War II was handed over to the Greek Navy. And John Epp, curator at the USS Slater, is going to kind of give us a little bit of the history behind what is now known as the Velos. And I'll tell you what, it's a fascinating story. It's... There's a little bit of, actually quite a bit of bravery behind it. So, uh, John, do you want me to just hand it over to you? Sure. We'll see if this works. Yeah. And if it doesn't, I've got some pictures of the, the Velos up um, ready to go, too. 
Let's see. And while you're doing that, like mm. I said, the Valos handed over to the Greek Navy. Actually, before John takes over real quick, I want to, I want to, this is kind of cool. So, you know, in talking about the, the Velos, uh, obviously this is a picture of the Velos uh, with the Greek flag on the transom. But what the other Fletchers stateside have been doing, picture of the Greek flag flying from the USS Kid. Picture of uh, <laughs> the guys at Cass and Young holding a Greek flag in front of the Cass and Young. Um, Buzz, as I understand, you weren't allowed to actually uh, fly that on the ship, correct? Correct. That's good to know. All right. And the Buffalo Naval Park, you can kind of see it off there in the, in the distance, the Greek flag flying on the USS The Sullivans. Um, Shane, are you the one that gets to hoist that up there? Uh, I did today. Yes, I did not do the uh, the Jolly Roger for the kid, but I did this one, and that's always fun. Gotcha, gotcha. So <laughs> yeah, and there's another picture of the Greek flag on the uh, the Velos. So John App, what do you have for us? All right. Uh, let's see which window. we go all right we see that okay yeah 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 looks good all right for anyone's wondering why Ooh. i'm the one talking about the velos or the charrette um we were unable to get them to come on our little talk show and since the slater was in the greek navy for 40 years the same period the, the, the velos was um i was assigned to this this task so uh uss Shred dd581 uh, we'll start with a little history. The namesake. Uh, a lot of people believe uh, destroyers, destroyer escorts, they're named after um, sailors who fall in battle. Uh, not the case with the Charette, actually. Uh, named after George Charette, who was born um, in 1867 in Massachusetts. He was in the Spanish-American War. He was a gunner's mate, third class. And he volunteered with seven others to uh, scuttle the Merrimack uh, in Cuba to prevent Spanish ships from escaping, essentially. Uh, a very elaborate plan. They, they strapped a bunch of torpedoes to the hull, uh, and they would electronically detonate it after steering the Merrimack into the harbor channel. Um, they did have a dinghy toward, uh, towed behind the Merrimack uh, to hopefully get off and uh, get picked up. It failed. <laughs> um, as they were approaching the channel, uh, the shore battery spotted them, fired at them, damaged their steering gear, and the Merrimack actually went off course and more or less grounded herself. Did not block the channel uh, really whatsoever. Uh, only three of the torpedoes actually detonated. Uh, apparently some of the batteries were damaged as well. Uh, they did escape, all of them. Um, none of them were killed, but they were all captured by the Spanish. Uh, however, a month later, they were swapped in a prisoner exchange. They all had the Medal of Honor awarded to them. And Charette, uh, he had a 40-year career in the Navy. He passed away in 1938. And then in World War II, they begin building a new Fletcher. And they decide to name it after George Charette. So we here we have the Charette in Boston. August of 43, shortly after her commissioning. So she was laid down in February of 1942 in Boston, launched in June, and commissioned almost a year later in 1943. And Eugene Carp was her first CEO. He was only the CEO of the ship uh, for a short while. Her main theater was in the Pacific. Uh, she arrived at Pearl Harbor in October of 43. Uh, mainly screening operations in the Marshall Islands, Macon, Tarawa. Uh, but she does have a history with a destroyer escort. In February of 44, um, around the Marshalls, a battleship uh, made uh, sonar contact, or a radar contact, rather, with a, uh, with a Japanese submarine. The Charette guided the Everett-class destroyer escort FAIR, uh, DE-35, in for a depth charge attack. And the fair was successful in sinking the sub. 
Now, all the sources I've looked at for this kind of seem to differ on which sub was sunk. I've seen I-21, uh, 175, and RL-39. Not exactly sure which one was sunk, but um, they all seem to differ for some reason. And she, of course, continued uh, screening operations into the spring and summer of 44. June 15th, uh, she sank a Japanese freighter uh, in conjunction with another uh, destroyer, the Boyd. 112 survivors were recovered by the Charette. And then we get to the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Um, she actually played an important role, not in necessarily shooting down aircraft, but in guiding our own planes back to their carriers in the middle of the night by using their signal lamps. And uh, any pilots that were forced to ditch in the water... Uh, the Charette rescued them. In September, she did splash numerous planes. Um, and afterwards, she actually screened the cruisers Canberra and Houston. They were damaged, and they helped, she helped bring them back to port. After this, we get to Leyte Gulf. And uh, she was part of the carrier group heading north. Uh, it was part of the distraction force in October. More carrier screening into 1945. And then she takes a little break from the Pacific. She, uh, From February to like late May, she returned to the United States to Puget Sound for an overhaul and some repairs. And then returned to the Pacific for the Borneo operations. In August, she and another destroyer, the Cooner, uh, they approached a ship. They had actually been tracking the ship um, during the nighttime. And then they discovered it was actually a Japanese hospital ship. They sent a boarding party on over. And while it was a hospital ship, they discovered able-bodied troops as well as a stash of ordnance. So they took everyone prisoner and escorted it back to Moritai. War ends. Uh, in, in September, she did a little more escort duty, uh, escorting uh, uh, occupation forces to China. And then in December, right before the New Year, she arrived back in the United States and enters reserve. And then in 1959, she was transferred to Greece and renamed Velos. Oh, it wasn't until 1959 that uh, she was transferred to Greece. Yeah, she had she had a little bit of time just sitting in the, in the reserve fleet. So. Okay. And for anyone wondering, Velos means arrow in Greek. Oh, I like how you did that, John. That was uh, that's nice. <laughs> no, Shane, it was totally unintentional. I did not know I hadn't done that until like an hour ago when I was looking at things. Nice. Yes. Well done. Um, so, uh, a detailed history on the Velos uh, for her um, thirty-year career uh, in the oh, just shy of thirty-year career in the Greek Navy. Couldn't really find much. Uh, same deal with the Slater. Like we don't know anything about the Slater's. Greek service. Um, but you can make some assumptions. Um, she did participate in most of the major Greek naval exercises, including uh, most NATO, NATO exercises. Um, there we go. Uh, Turkey and Greece, they're always butting heads. Uh, so she did play a role in uh, the Aegean Sea crises that popped up over the decades during the Cold War. Uh, but what she's probably most famous for happened on May 25th, 1973. Um, something you don't really see too often in the Navy. Um, during a NATO exercise, her commander uh, learned that some naval officers that he actually worked close with back in Greece were arrested and tortured in Greece by the military junta. Uh, now, the junta, uh, or the regime of the colonels, it was a right-wing military dictatorship that overthrew the government a month before the elections of 1967, and they ruled until 1974. And Commander Pepes was not a fan of them. He he ruled. He he was a constitution guy. He was all uh, democracy. He did not like the junta. Um, he had actually been part of a secret group of really naval officers. They were hoping to overthrow the Junta eventually. They were working on it. However, some of the, the officers that were arrested in this uh, were also part of that plan. And so he, he realized hope was probably lost. 
So he decided <coughs> to defect. Well, not defect, but political assignment, asylum. Um, he he called all of his crew onto the stern of the, the Velos. He told them what was going on back home in Greece and explains that he wanted to seek political asylum in Italy and try to work from there to overthrow the junta. They all supported him 100%. So he contacted uh, NATO headquarters and uh, he quoted the preamble of the North Atlantic Treaty uh, to NATO headquarters themselves saying all governments are determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilization of their peoples, founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. And he used this as a basis to depart their formation, and they set course for Italy, uh, ultimately anchoring a few miles off the coast, and they sent a whaleboat to shore and eventually to Rome. And a press conference was held the next day with the commander where he explained the entire situation. Now, we got to remember back in the 70s, there was no social media or anything. So the world wasn't really in tune with what was going on in Greece as much as they would be today. Uh, so him exposing everything that's going on was, uh, was, was shocking and actually did help overthrow the junta a year later. Um, the commander, six officers, and 25 petty officers all requested asylum. The entire crew of the Velos wanted to do the same, uh, but they were told not to and actually to return to Greece uh, for fear that the Junta would retaliate against their families. A month later, Velos did return to Greece with uh, some new officers, uh, but the 32 men that requested asylum stayed in Italy and worked behind the scenes until the fall of the Junta in 1974 in July. He continued his naval career, ultimately retiring as an admiral, and he passed away in 2013. Uh, he had cancer. And today, the Velos isn't only a museum dedicated to telling the history of the ship, but it's actually the museum of the struggle against the dictatorship, where they tell the story of the struggle of the Greek people against the Junta. Uh, for the past 21 years, she's uh, been moored in uh, Thessaloniki. I can't pronounce it. I'm sorry. Thessaloniki. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> it's close. Um, and this I found very curious. Two euros for general admission. That's $2.16. Huh. Wow. So it's sounds close. like we need to lower our prices, gentlemen. I <laughs> not <laughs> say that. Um, so wait a second. So <laughs> you know, why, why is it so hard? Okay. If you found out what they're getting for general admission, uh, why What's is it so hard <laughs> to, to figure out what, what the deal is? At least I had a hard time figuring out, you know, what the current state of the Velos is. So are you, were you in contact with them or did you find a website? Nope. I've tried contacting, uh, multiple museums and archives in Greece. I've tried contacting the Velos. Uh, I've never really had uh, mm. much contact, just the basic histories here and there. Also keep in mind that Velos is still a commissioned ship in the Hellenic Navy. It is. Yep. It is? It's still considered yes. in commission, yes. Really? Like uh, our so She's still seaworthy. Yep. Oh, like the Constitution. Okay. All right. Um, and I forgot to add it to this. Uh, <laughs> but was it back in March, I believe, or was it April? A storm blew in and she got a little bit of damage. I think her hull was breached a little bit uh, in a storm. Hmm. Yeah, she was sheltered in Athens uh, for a good long while, but political mm -hmm. fortunes change in Greece, and um, she was eventually ushered out of Athens and sent up to Thessaloniki, which is not a protected harbor, and that's why yep. she suffered the storm damage she did. Um, so... If she had remained in Athens, if she would have been allowed to remain in Athens, she was in a better protected harbor there. So, yeah, you got you have to read between the lines on some of these things for when you're talking about Greece. <laughs> oh, you know what? I forgot. Here's a couple photographs. 
Yeah, uh, so that. all these photographs are uh, from navsource.org. I highly recommend if anyone's interested in museum ships, which I'm assuming you are. Um, some great resources, some great photographs there. And they also list for most ships all the commanding officers, uh, which is just a, a huge help when you're doing research. Uh, so this research. is the same photograph from earlier. And they're all user submitted photographs as well. Whoa. If you want your if you want your name on a website, submit a photograph. Uh, this is the Velos um, in Italy, uh, more or less the same uh, day when uh, when they when they when they moored. Um, so that's their launch. You can see all their their sailors. I gotta say, I love the Greek uniform, <laughs> short shorts and everything. It's. I love this is from Navsource again. This cartoon, it's um, from an Australian, um, but it's uh, the Junta, the statue, and then the Velos crushing it. Mm. Um, just thought it was really cool. Uh, these are all Fletchers in Greece. Uh, I can tell you which one. Wait, ones wait, wait. Go, yeah, go back to that picture. Those, those are all. I love how they're all lined up like that. Yeah, so which ones we got? All right, uh, we have... Uh, this is 1979. Uh, the Kimon, the, uh, which was the, the Ringold, DD-500. Uh, there's the Wadsworth, DD-516. The Aulic, 569. The Connor, 582. The Hall, 583. And Velos. Uh, there's also some uh, LSTs as well in these dry docks. Hmm. And there she is today. Really? Wow. Yeah. What I love about what I love about this, and that shows it really well, is that she is in a very similar configuration as the Sullivans, missing Mount Fifty Three, but she has the Mark Fifty Six computer or, or uh, director. Uh, for the three inch on the aft superstructure right above the deck house. That is awesome. And I'm yeah. assuming the damage was uh, running against the uh, the seawall here, but I, I don't quite remember. She was thrown against that seawall, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay. You Sideways, or is it the transom? She's normally moored stern side to the dock there. That's how they normally yeah. have her. But the storm threw her up against the dock. Wow. You know, when, when you hear something like that, and if there's any kind of a government situation where it's like, well, should we continue to fund this? Should we not? You know, I mean, so when you hear about the Velos being pushed into the the pier or the shore like that, what do you, what do you think the chances are that that'll be the end of the ship? My understanding is it wasn't major, major damage. Uh, I okay. believe they're open. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think they're going to scrap the ship, and and it is still a museum ship for them. So, uh -huh. um, but we stand ready to scavenger if they do. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> yeah, I'll bet there's all kinds of stuff on there that uh, you guys could could make use of. Um, yeah. So when you, well, okay. So when you talk about um, the charrette being transferred over to the Greek Navy in the late 50s. Um, I was kind of surprised to learn when I was talking to Parks earlier today on the phone that that's not the only situation where we've transferred ships to other countries. Parks was talking about uh, Japan. Um, I was talking to Shane about you know that, that this is a common practice I, i'll be blunt it's one i don't know much about so i mean what can, what can you guys tell me about that well greece did get the biggest number of fletchers uh she got, she ended up with 10 fletchers in the hellenic navy uh but overall there were 60 fletchers that found themselves in foreign service 60 after, after the war 60 fletchers yes yeah they went to Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Greece, as we've talked about, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Peru, South, uh, uh, South Korea, Spain, Republic of China, Turkey, and West Germany. 
Now, West wow. Germany would transfer hers over to uh, Greece later, and that would be why one of the reasons why mm. Greece received the bulk of the Fletchers, a sixth of the Fletchers that went in foreign service. And I think more yeah, recently, oh, sorry. No, oh, real quick. Yeah, forty-five DEs were transferred after the war as well. So, mm. yeah, it's not. It's 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 pretty wide. And a lot of Sumners and Gearings as well. Yeah. But as uh, Tim and I were talking about earlier today, where you see these countries where these Fletchers went to, um, basically you're seeing the American Navy putting their ships out there on the front lines against communism, part of that containment strategy that was uh, started in the 50s and was a good part of our Cold War strategy till the uh, uh, fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. So the Fletchers yeah. were on the front line, even after World War II. Yeah, and I think more recently, uh, I think it's Turkey has received about 23 or 24 of our frigates that we've put out, out of commission or uh, given to them, you know, they go out of, they go out of commission here and then immediately into commission in the other uh, foreign Navy. So I think, yeah, since mm -hmm. maybe 1999 to present, they've received maybe even, maybe even 30 frigates from us, uh, FFs and FFGs uh, from us. I think it's Turkey. I could be wrong. But. Yeah, the ship I was on, the Miller was transferred to Turkey mm. after it was decommissioned a few years in the Boneyard in Philly and then off to Turkey for parts. Hmm. And what was the what was the Miller? It was an FF 1091. Okay. It's you know, a, I also it, loved it. It's a destroyer escort. Yeah. It's, it's a box <laughs> class. Yeah. yeah well, you're I, talking more modern ships. The uh, second USS Kid DDG 993 is currently in service ooh. with the Navy of the Republic of China. And so she may see war uh, pretty soon. Uh, <laughs> maybe not, but let's hope not. Do, they, do you know if they ever fly the Jolly Roger? They well, <laughs> they inherited the the pirate legacy from us as well as the USS Kid DG one hundred. It's currently serving the U.S. Navy, but uh, nine nine three was not so. Uh, she didn't she didn't show her pirate colors too much during her career, not as much as six six one and one hundred. Some of her CEOs were a little more stricter about going mm. by the book. Interesting. What I love, John, about your uh, presentation that I did not know is that she, uh, the charrette was then part of Crip Div 1 uh, with the Houston and Canberra along with the Sullivans, you know, protecting and screening those two uh, cruisers there and labeled Cripple Division 1 from uh, Admiral Halsey. So that was nice that you shared that. Thank you. I didn't know that. Yeah, John's presentation um, pointed out a few things. I, I definitely want to look up that story. Um, Which one's that? Well, you know, you about the, <laughs> about the and, and the, uh, what was that, in the uh, 18, was it 1867? Um, oh, yeah, George Charette. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're talking about uh, 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 electronic torpedoes and batteries. And it's like, I'm going, that was going on in 1867? Mm. Yeah. Uh, I had I had no idea. And no, 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 no. He, um, he, Charette was born in 1867. It uh, was Spanish American War. Yeah, he's talking about the Spanish American War. Oh, geez. Okay. Well, but still, <laughs> I mean, okay. So it's not as all right. But the Spanish American War was give me a 1898. Date, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So right. still, I, I I'm just still surprised that that kind of technology existed um you know 120 some years ago well let's have a little education here please so where, do, where do destroyers come from where does the name destroyer come from it was originally from the torpedo boat destroyers that were created to counter the new technological threat that came into being in the late 1880s the self-propelled torpedo so torpedoes were coming in line before online before the Spanish American War, and um, and and destroyers were invented to counter that torpedo. Later, they put torpedoes into submarines, and then the destroyers concentrated on the submarines, 
and da 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 da. World War II, we've got a multi-purpose platform that can do just about anything. Uh-huh. Yeah, I also read that they were a, a counter to uh, battleships as well. Battleship growth in 1895 with the second class battleships that they that really propelled other countries who couldn't afford to build a battleship uh, as a potential uh, counteraction between the for a battleship. That's what I've read, but I don't know if that's true. But uh-huh. yeah. Well, uh, the, the, the Fletchers would be carrying 10 torpedoes, which were meant for surface ships. And mm-hmm. uh, we've got several examples of Fletchers who did use them against surface ships and uh, successfully. I actually, actually Connor was talking to us earlier before we, we went live. Uh, he has a discovered a model of the Melvin, which was which was a Fletcher. And I dug into it before we got into the, went live. And Melvin actually was credited with sinking the battleship Fuso with her yeah. torpedo. Mm. Yeah. And... Um, um oh gosh what was hmm. hey, is, this, the is this the velos yeah. right here yes yeah, yeah. Yeah. very well maintained wow. look at yeah that. Look at beautiful that. well yeah. i didn't realize it was still in commission as parks pointed out you know uh in commission with the greek navy and john mentioned oh geez a couple of different times one of the reasons why the slater is is in the condition that that it's in is because it served in the Greek Greek Navy and, uh, up until the 90s, correct? Yeah, 1991. Yeah. And uh, they dry docked her after they decommissioned her in 91 before there was ever dick discussions with us to get her back. And then in, in 93, they dry docked her again in preparation to give the ship to us. So, mm. yeah, she was in, so she was in pretty good see- condition. When you see pictures like this, you know, like of the torpedo tubes, and first of all, you know, Tim's point about, you know, sinking a a battleship with the torpedoes, you can see the uh, torpedo tubes right here. Um, I could see why Parks would, you know, if they do decide to scrap (laughs) the We've got claims on those three-inch 50s, though, Ken. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, you can have the three-inch 50s. I want the torpedo mount. Okay. Buzz, buzz what you want. <laughs> now, now, our Greek viewers were not trying to take Velos. <laughs> yeah. That is a trip, trip here. That's just, we are honoring Velos today and her right. parts. Careful, these guns might still work. <laughs> mm. um, no, I, do, I, is there, do they have their practice loader, their five-inch practice loader, for gosh sakes? Is that... It would be love to see that, you know, but it looks like that might be where the practice loader would have been port side near the. Uh, no, there, there's no practice loader that that I've seen on any photograph of Velos. It's gone. What is that behind Shane and, and John's pictures there? Uh, I can't. That see. looks like a practice. I loader. could have yeah, sworn I, I saw zoom in a enough. travel blog that showed it. I don't. <laughs> yeah, that's your practice loader right there. Yeah. OK, well. Yeah. They moved it over there. Okay, that's why I couldn't see it in other picture, in other photos that I looked at. That's what it is in front of the uh, the darkened area. It, it looks like it to me. It looks a little like, different from it ours. But... It, it doesn't. Look... What what is a practice loader? A practice loader is a uh, basically a mock up of the of the interior of one of the five inch guns, and the gun crews get around it and train on it so that they get the physical motions of loading and and firing and moving the the projectiles and powder casings for loading if, and unloading if that's a practice loader it doesn't look like ours or any other no it doesn't look like ours yeah, I, I, that's a weird one uh or i would consider it weird because i'm not used to it but <laughs> uh, i don't know i don't she doesn't have the sta- the standard practice loaders that we have on our ships. This may be I mean, something else. Yeah, uh, I zoomed in a little bit. It actually looks like there's a computerized gun sight at the top of that tower. Hmm. And to me, like it, you know, it's the 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 rectangle I, I that has it. that. Oh, you found it. You found it. I'm pretty sure I found it. Wait, let hold me, on. Uh, let me let me switch to another. Uh, see that that doesn't have it. I want to see if any of these other pictures. Uh, I guess not. I thought I had. What does that? Is that a different view? Does that help? Not really. It it's is a different it. view of it, though. Yeah. Yeah, it is a different view, and 
I don't know. What Maybe that it's is. not. I don't know. I don't know what that is. There it is. There's, there's, yeah. yeah. There it That's is. It. It's on starboard side. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so there, yes, they're practiced. There's the torpedo yeah. tube above. All right. Yeah, same That's location fine. as Cass and Young. Really? Okay. We obviously need to know more about each other's ships. Yeah. So you road trip. Deal. Road trip. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't no road where she's at. <laughs> Well, okay, wait, I'm still, I still don't understand though. Okay, I, okay, so you explained, yeah, this is uh, this is where they can practice, you know, operating the gun, loading the gun, that type of thing. Why wouldn't you just? Why do you need this taking up space on the deck of a ship? Why wouldn't you just practice in the middle of the what is it, the Mark Thirty One um, housing? Why why wouldn't you just practice oh, in the gun? In the actual gun. In the yeah, actual gun mount. The Mark well, 31, uh, yeah. yeah. With this one, you, you're you out in the open, so it's not quite as hot, for one thing, because those, those enclosed mounts trap a lot of heat. Um, the other thing is the chief can walk around the mount, mm. and I'm, I'm surmising. I, I have not been in the Navy. I was not on a Fletcher. I have not messed with these. But your chief can move around and observe all the guys from behind them as they're operating without those enclosed yeah. mounts cramping him up. Mm -hmm. And he can, you know, make suggestions, I would assume, uh, because they actually fire the little wooden wooden bullet up. It drops into it. It hits the end of the barrel and drops into a tray, and then they pick it up and put it right back over. They're just getting the motions down. Mm. So, right. That, yeah, that would uh, be my guess. Yeah, you have to have muscle memory with this stuff because you're firing 12 to 20 a minute. You can't be thinking about what you're doing. You have to actually just mechanically do it. Uh, we actually have a, a, a practice powder can that was uh, given to us. And what I've found so far is we have a practice pro projectile that was solid brass. Uh, they didn't want to use uh, Of course, you don't want to practice with any live cans or live projectiles. <laughs> so this allows you to have a, a minimal amount of that and... I, I got a kick out of that. The chief can make suggestions. <laughs> Being a former <laughs> chief, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sure the Denozo, uh, the Denozo movement actually occurred long before NCIS ever came along. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, Ken also, in a in a operating mount, there are eleven men in there at once. Ah. It's not just a single or two or three. It is 11 men. Okay. So it's a ballet that has to be practiced before you go into the enclosure. Yeah, there was a, a – Shane was nice enough to do a video of the process that would go on inside of one of those mounts. We did it for one of the uh, viewers. They had a question about what their uncle was would have been going through on the USS Johnston before it went down. And, yeah, that was a, that was a pretty – pretty interesting situation but then you just reminded me yeah there's 11 oh hey look at that so a little different but that's the, that's the slater that's the slater's three inch practice lower that's the crew oh you kind of but you kind of get an idea what's going on yeah yeah it's probably now that triggers it could be for a study for other gun crews uh you know to stand there and watch and to analyze Along mm -hmm. with the chief, Petty Officer. We're talking with the chief or senior chief, right? <laughs> yeah, so it could be something that other people can have eyes on in other uh, gun crews uh, and teams. But Shane, remind me. Competition. So Who's going to be the better gun crew? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So the Sullivans does not have a practice loader, correct? C correct. We do but not. But the kid and the Cass and Young, they both do? Yes. Yes. And and clearly we were looking at pictures of the Velos, and so wow, that's that, I I never knew something like that existed. So I appreciate you guys kind of giving me a little bit of education on that. Um, yeah, okay, that makes me angry. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is. No I didn't practice. realize all three of you had the uh, practice loader. There is no longer any practice loader aboard Johnston or Samuel B. Roberts. I can tell you that. Oh, because hmm. it was blown away. Well, Johnston broke right there where the practice loader is. Oh, um, I see. It was wiped off the deck, and on on Sammy B, it, it just came off somehow. 
along with the torpedo tubes. Yeah. You know, when yeah, you dive on the, something uh, like the loader that, would have been. Go ahead, John. Wait, no, the practice loader on John C. Butler was. Was behind back the, aft. Behind, yeah, back behind aft. the mount, right? Yeah. Forward of the after mount. Yes. It's no yeah. longer there. Yeah, yeah. But th neither is the deck house either. Right. So, yeah. No, I was kind of making a joke. <laughs> Um, so as a piece of equipment, like a, like a practice loader, you know, if you're, if you're going down to the Johnston or the Samuel B. Roberts, it, well, in the case of the Samuel B. Roberts, what you were one of the few that actually identified that, oh, there's a triple tor torpedo tube set up that kind of lets you know that it was the Samuel B. Roberts. Um, if you would have seen a practice loader just lying on the middle of the ocean floor, mm. what would that have told you? Um, Given where we found Sammy B. Roberts, it possibly could have been off Johnston or it could have been an indication of the hole. Okay. Um, or, or Sammy B. But, uh, but yeah, uh, if we, if we find a practice loader lying on the bottom out there, it could be, it would have come off one of those three ships. So you were kind of lucky that it was actually a triple torpedo tube setup that was found first. Oh, good lord, yes. Because <laughs> yeah. we, we were going after Gambier Bay, right? And and then when we <laughs> saw the triple loader, we go oh, with the triple uh, uh, torpedo mount. <laughs> and then then the the mission changed. We don't have Gambier Bay. We have Sammy B. Roberts, and maybe Gambier Bay's close by. We didn't see her, but we found Sammy B. Well, let's see. It's been an hour, and I wanted to, once we got to this point, I wanted to wrap things up. And was there anything, but before we do, was there anything else that you guys wanted to add about uh, U.S. vessels, U.S. Navy vessels that made their way into foreign navies? The yeah, longevity of them, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. Taiwan mm -hmm. and South Korea and Mexico, they're... Fletchers served into the like 19, I think South Korea and Taiwan retired theirs in 1999, all of them. Yeah. And then um, Mexico's last one retired in 2001. So Fletcher's had long, long legs uh, in, in service in foreign navies. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of artifacts left over, a lot of pieces surviving. If you go to Taiwan, uh, you'll trip over gun mounts and, and mast and propellers and everything from those four hmm. Fletchers that they had. So there might be a practice loader somewhere in Taiwan waiting <laughs> to be put up as a monument that you might be able to find. I will look into that. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. Wait, how do you know that? How do you know that, Tim, have you been over there? I have not been over there, but we on Facebook, we started a little series about, you know, there's only four Fletchers left, but there's other surviving pieces. And it, it started out Ooh. just kind of let me acknowledge the pieces that we know about. And we know about the Bell of the Dyson, which is one of these that that went. I think she went to Germ West Germany. Um, we had it for a while. And then the crew um, asked to move it to where she was built in Orange, Texas uh, for a memorial over there, which we. We moved it. Over, we let them take it over there and it's there for people to see. Freedom Park in Nebraska in Omaha has the nameplates for two of the Fletchers. They cut them off the stern and just mounted them up like signposts in the park, along with a bunch of other ships uh, nameplates. Um, and we knew about the mast and the torpedo tubes for the foot, which are in Fredericksburg at the Nimitz Museum. And the more we began looking online and just searching for this running series of posts on our Facebook page, more stuff started coming out. And I was contacted by a gentleman, uh, a retiree from the Taiwanese Navy, and he had served on one of them. And he started shooting me pictures of all sorts of stuff from Mulaney, uh, from the Kimberly, the Twining, the Yornal. And sorry, I hit my computer. And uh, there, there's a whole bunch more that he's trying to track down to identify which ship, you know, this gun mount that's sitting underneath one of their big highway bridges uh, is wow. from and everything. It's, it's looking at the pictures of the 
of the two parks, like the military remembrance parks that he has sent me and that I found on Google. Uh, there's all sorts of military memorabilia in Taiwan. They really are vested in their military history. Hmm. There's still a destroyer escort in service, and it's in Taiwan. Wow. Uh, the from Hemingway. World War Two. From World War Two, one of the DEs oh. we gave them after oh. the war. It's a training ship now, but it's still in service. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> one of the things that really strikes me when I looked at the history of these different Fletchers that ended foreign service, especially were the ones that ended up with their former enemies, like the uh, USS uh, Haywood L. Uh, Edwards, that was a you know was also fought in the Battle of Surigao Strait against uh, Fuso and Yamashiro. Um, you know, she ended up in Japanese service as the Araki. And, um, well, and, and the USS Richard P. Larry, who was a Yurugi, uh, uh, Yurugi, uh, Yuguri, um, they both fought against the Japanese in World War II. And then years later, 1959, they entered into the Japanese Maritime Self Defense Force and served into the 70s. So it's, um, I, I wonder what the reunions were like for those crews. <laughs> um, I was I, I, I was surprised when we were when I was studying for this thing to find out that the um, the Herman, which was at the Battle of Lady Gulf and was the only destroyer that went in against the Japanese and came back, uh, ended up in Argentine service. Um, I think so I it was interesting that. to see that. I'm, I'm curious to whether she actually fought against the Brits. During the fall. She did. Mm -hmm. well, she did. Um, let's see. She fired. I got a couple of notes here. Um, buh, 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 buh. Hearman? Yeah. Um, Apologize. No, this I'm sorry. One? Cowell, this one of her sister ships, fired yeah, shots yeah, at right. R okay. RRS Shackleton. That, so that, it's, it's 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 interesting how the game board changes on you, mm -hmm. which I guess we could segue into World of Warships on that on that note. But um, yeah, just interesting um, that these that these ships served in their former enemies' navies. But it just goes to show, and that's one thing that I always bring up to people when, like, on our Kamikaze Remembrance Day, why will we why will we uh, uh, mentioning the kamikaze who died diving into kid and the point is is that we're no longer warships of world war ii we're museum ships of 2023 and the world has changed in that time our former en enemies are now our staunchest allies and we've got new enemies and so it's 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 interesting how again like i said the game board changes of it with time Anyway, that was just me musing, stuff that mm -hmm. occurred to me as I was looking into the fate of all these Fletchers that went into foreign navies. Well, yeah, and uh, we also used we also used the um, uh, we also used these as incentives to uh, you know to gain influence over countries as well that maybe were kind of on the fence, you know, communism or democracy, uh, and. So we there'd be the little carrots with the probably the sticks a few years earlier, but now little carrots. Well, so the I point, agree. yeah, the point is, is that Fletchers were always put in harm's way, well, when they were built, or uh, in, in, under American service in World War II, or into the Cold War, and then into foreign navies. They were always put on the front lines. Mm -hmm. nice. Well, I love the stories. So, um, hmm. with uh, well, you, and you can continue uh, musing because what I was going to do here <laughs> was uh, pull this picture up and say, "All right, guys from the USS Kid, Tim Nesmith, ship superintendent, Park Stevenson, uh. museum director. What do you guys have uh, have coming up as we shut this down? So, what's what's coming up this summer for the Kid?" More of what we do every day. Yeah. <laughs> Sweating. We we <laughs> we, um, we, uh, in, we invite visitors to the ship. Um, we keep it open year round, and we 
slowly but surely work on restoration. Um, we've got, you know, people ask us, why is this rusty? Why hasn't this been painted recently? Well, we've, you know, 300 men worked on this ship's daily maintenance when she was in service. Today we have basically two. Um, and, uh, but, but we keep her with us. We are looking, uh, I'm, I'm working out of my office with the state legislature, which, which is in session right now, trying to put forward a bill to get uh, some money for dry dock. And after we get something from the state, we will pursue federal funding too, um, which Sullivan's, the, the Sullivan's gave us kind of a roadmap for. We'll be following along that path if we can, uh, so that we can give this 80 year old woman who hasn't seen a doctor since she was in her twenties, uh, a routine checkup. Well, and that's one thing I want to mention again. If anyone is interested in supporting the kids' efforts to get into the dry dock and you want to make a donation, you can definitely head over to the uh, the website, which is USSKid.com. Or if you quickly want to head over to History X, like I said, you can click the button lower right-hand corner and YouTube donates or conveys 100% of the proceeds over to the kid, which Park said earlier, goes directly into maintenance. Um, Parks, I, I I do want to say how you go back to your comments about how people always say stupid things. Oh, there's rust everywhere. Blah blah blah. I I do enjoy how you respond to people on social media. Hmm. You're you're very blunt, and you just you you're down like okay, if you don't like it, come on down and paint it. <laughs> Put your money where you go. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Tim taught me that actually. So I learned. I learned it from the other Tim. Which, by yeah. the way, John, I apologize. I saw on social media you you go to bat for us, and the other Tim like kind of spanked your hand a little bit for for saying that all museum ships have <laughs> rust. Uh, <laughs> yes, but if you ask Tim when he's looking at the Slater. Mm -hmm. Looks beautiful. Everything dazzle. Tim, should look good. No, I see rust everywhere. All he sees is a rust bucket mm. when he looks. At mm. yes. Well, yeah. we were talking about that the other day about how we uh, we had the video for today's uh, World of Warships uh, event, and we were what reviewing it, making suggest editing suggestions, and she looks beautiful. It's like she pops when somebody takes a picture of her, or takes video of her. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, I stand in that same space and the human eye finds the tiniest flaw because <laughs> we're trained to look for what's wrong. And so we can't enjoy the ship the way, say, general public does. And, you know, they come in. Oh, it looks great. Oh, the ship looks like crap. You know, you know, this and this and this. And I, I don't know. I, I blame Rizzuto because he taught me so. <laughs> I blame Rizzuto. Like, he taught me. Yeah, we all blame. All right. Him. Well, this. Yeah, this is. Uh, yeah, we'll have to bring this Rizzuto we can do a podcast guy. On, this guy uh, is. We got to bring him on. I that? love the throwback photo he shared of uh, him on the paint float. That was pretty cool. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was young. He. Uh, I've he seen was some young, young at the time. Talk yeah. to Sikowski. He'll show you some really young pictures of. of, 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 of yeah. Well, there's a there's also a name that needs to be mentioned. The Ed guru Zikowski, of blueprints yeah. and and yeah. general Fletcher knowledge. I think Ed Zakowski has helped all of us yes. with our ships. Is Absolutely. he is he like a an expert in what the architecture of the Fletchers or destroyers in general? He's a master chief. Oh, got it. Yeah. That pretty much. <laughs> he would. Know. He was. He was. Was he working or was he volunteering at Kennedy when Tim started at Kennedy? He, um, so he's, he's a, I think he's a destroyer man. Um, in the seventies, he lives down in Pennsylvania when they were scrapping all the ships in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, mostly destroyers or whatnot. Um, he basically, how he tells it is he went there one day and, um, the holds were just full of documents and blueprints. Mm. And, uh, he, back then they didn't care what happened to things. So he more or less asked the uh, the strippers, the ship strippers, "Hey, <laughs> can I can, can I take this stuff?" And they're like, "Yeah, take it," because 
<laughs> it's it's a fire hazard for us. Yeah. So he, I, I believe he has thousands of mm. manuals, blueprints. So you're talking about Ash now. Uh, I've yes, heard his yeah. basement looks like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's what yeah, I've heard. Then, I've oh, never yes, seen it. Right. It's a, it's a Tim, bucket list destination for me. Tim Rizzuto was the s- superintendent, I believe, of the Joseph P. Kennedy. I think so, um, yeah. And, yeah. And then Ed started volunteering there, and that's how they got together. And they've well, been, so, so last time I was at Slater, Tim went, was and there came, too. went to came home. Rizzuto gave me a folder. And in there were all of the letters that he wrote to the Navy. He wanted a Fletcher class destroyer badly. And he, he wrote to the Navy and they shuttled him around from desk to desk, to desk, to desk, to desk. And he never gave up. He never lost heart. They were blowing him off. It was obvious, but official them. They couldn't just say no. They just redirected him and they kept redirecting him until finally they, he wore the Navy down. And that's where that and that and that seemed to coincide with the effort in Baton Rouge to get a destroyer. And so it was a marriage made in heaven. Mm. Uh, that's... Uh, I will. I'll share a photograph once I find it, but you guys can keep talking amongst yourselves. Well, <laughs> let's we'll wrap yeah. we'll wrap up the uh, the kid here real quick. Like I uh, like I was saying, if you want to support the kid, uh, you can definitely get on their website the uh, www.usskid.com thank you connor for pulling that up mm-hmm. as well as their youtube channel just simply just get on youtube and search for uss kid veterans museum and it comes right up nice job and let's see while john is looking for that picture let's pull up buzz real quick and buzz what's the latest or what do you guys have coming up with friends of the cast and young on facebook well, we've got uh, the Park Service seasonal employees are going to be starting next week, which means the ship will start opening daily. Uh, right now, it's just weekends, and the volunteers are opening on weekends, and they're averaging about 600 a day. Uh, even though the ship is officially closed, um, we're allowed to open it up on the weekends with our staff. Uh, Shane, big thing Shane, we've why, got coming. Why are you shaking your head? It, Wait, did you me? say 600 people a day are visiting? That's what he yeah. said. Yeah, that's why I did that. <laughs> wow. We've been yeah, open. Yeah, we don't, we don't, yeah, we don't see 600 a day. That would be, uh, this isn't about the Buffalo Naval Park in that sense, but we hit 600 people probably two or three days a season. But you're just saying, oh, yeah, 600 a day, no problem. But and they the haven't Boston even officially opened Constitution, yet. I know, right. That's well, right. Yeah, we have the Constitution. And then they see the gray thing uh, down at the end and go, oh, what's that? <laughs> a lot of them think we're act- still active duty. But uh, <laughs> but we do get them. Um, uh, the other thing we've got coming is uh, early June, we have uh, uh, Admiral Cox, who's the uh, head of the Navy Historical Command, coming aboard. Mm. Uh, one of our volunteers used to work for him when they were both active duty. So he's been invited and where we earned that maintenance award uh, last year, he decided to come over and see, uh, see the ship. Uh, other than that, a lot of maintenance going on. Uh, our one ranger aboard that uh, does maintenance is always painting. And uh, we're actually rehabbing our, our workshop on the pier. Uh, our 92 year old volunteer isn't able to volunteer anymore. So we're in there cleaning, spiffing up and reorganizing. And, so. and, and you had said a few moment or a while ago that the national park service is actually starting work on the cradles in the eventuality that Cassie and Young will end up in dry dock. Yes, correct. Uh, I believe it's uh, about four to five years out, which gives it a 15 year from the last time which is what their goal is. So our, our head of maintenance told us the other day that they'd actually started constructing them. And Connor just popped up a question. How many volunteers do you have? Uh, total, we've got on paper somewhere around 20, 25. Wow. However, a lot of them don't show. We don't see them often. Do you uh, serve them lunch? Pardon me? Do you serve them lunch? Uh, no. 
Well, um, you might want to start. If you start, if, bribe them with food is what I always say. If there's a pizza involved, I'll yeah. do anything. It's interesting. All of our volunteers have been to leave within 30 minutes after lunch is over. It's, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if there's a correlation there. but Well, then you have to keep pushing lunch back and back. Oh, lunch is at 2 o'clock today, boys. Uh -huh. oh, it's 2.30, right? Yeah. yeah. We've got a core group probably of about uh, – eight to 10, what we call the wrench turners. They're the people that actually get their hands dirty. And we've got uh, about four volunteers that just do tours and don't even know one end of a screwdriver from the other. But, uh, you know, we're all in it for the ship. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we've got some that just can't make it anymore, uh, you know, due to illness or uh, age, you know, like our friend Hank, that's, uh, just been, in, he calls it, incarcerated in a nursing home for a while. But uh, it, it, yeah. it works. Yeah. And for, uh, for anyone that wants to learn more about the USS Cass and Young, it's best to visit on Facebook, Friends of the Cass and Young. Uh-oh, Tim's on. Tim's on. Uh, wait, oh, uh -oh. no. Tim's been uh -oh. watching. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> Give them a cruiser. <laughs> well, great. Buffalo Naval Park has both. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's hilarious. Uh, well, speaking of Tim, I found the photograph. <laughs> uh -oh. <That's> time. <laughs> Perfect timing. There we go. There's the crew. That's there from last go. October. Oh, yes. So, yeah, Parks, our cook, Blair, who comes up for our work weeks. And if we have a VIP such as Parks, he'll come up and cook for him. And there's there's the grumpy old man, Ed, Ed Zukowski. He's, he's who we were talking about. And then our, our fearless leader, Tim. <laughs> Dynamic duo. And that's Tony. Yeah. Uh, Parks, do you remember being there for this picture? Oh, yeah. Okay. I always remember Blair's cooking. <laughs> oh, it was good, right? Mm, nice. Uh, well, let's see. Let's get back to. Well, it's good to know Tim was watching or supervising. I don't know which which is which. Uh, mm, true. Let's see. So, Tim, for Tim and Parks, you guys already did your World of Warships today. Yeah, it was. Uh, I want to say eleven thirty uh, oh, UTC. Okay. We were like okay. third third up. Uh, gotcha. But since I was on the paint float and Parks was doing interviews, oh. we had we had it pre recorded. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Nice. And was that just for today? The, there's no other, as far as yeah, you guys know, anyway. It's just like a 24 hour. Yeah, they, I think they had 23 museum ships uh, scheduled. Okay. If not museum ships, then museums and museum ships. I think there were a few that might not have had a ship. I don't know. I wasn't familiar with them. Uh, so we, we'll, uh, we'll make our film available on our, on our channel. Uh, let's see. Move it over to the Buffalo Naval Park. Um, I know we yeah, talked about guys. it earlier, but what's what's coming up for the Buffalo Naval Park? Just really briefly, we've got uh, Memorial Day coming up. You know, I think we have. We were in a staff meeting on yesterday, and we have a ceremony, Memorial Day ceremony at nine, ten, noon, one, three, and they're all disparate, different groups. So that's always a big weekend for us. Uh, and that usually for us means the uh, Memorial Day weekend is like when our season really starts. Uh, and then we it's uh, just, you know, chickens with our heads cut off until uh, a week or so after Labor Day. So, we're you know, again, we had a, a great volunteers uh, through a, a local bank uh, yes, uh, today and tomorrow coming, maybe 30 to 40. Uh, doing some work on Little Rock. And uh, so there's a lot of energy going on. Uh, you know, for myself, we published a, a, the, the Arcadia book, uh, The Buffalo Naval Park, which is 182 historic images, I think. So uh, that's an exciting thing. And I'm, a, I'm proud of that. So yeah, just uh, encampments are still going strong. I know Stephen's not here tonight, but, uh, you know, so we get 180 to 220 kids every encampment. So yeah, things are good. And did, so did you say you had a bunch of volunteers from uh, from various banks on board doing odd jobs? Yeah, they were, I think they were on the, O. today they were on the O three 3 level uh, of, of Little Rock. 
near the uh, chaff launchers and stuff. So like the bridge wings, they were scraping and painting. And then tomorrow they will continue to do uh, continue to do that. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah, because I know yeah. you're, you're always trying to build up your volunteer program. So for yeah. anyone that's interested in volunteering, Connor had it up there a little bit ago. You can check out the website, buffalonavalpark.org. Thank you, Connor. Pulled it right up there. And the videos. Shane is always posting new videos on their YouTube channel. Search for Buffalo Naval Park. Or more interestingly, you can even join their members group where you get more behind the scenes uh, access on the members uh, section. I'm a member myself, so I always enjoy seeing that stuff. So uh, for, there, Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. There is a comment. Do we have power restored on the Sullivans yet? So uh, we do have power restored to the aft, though we actually haven't turned on any light fixtures or anything yet, but we know that power is running to the aft of the ship. We're having a little problem with the bus tie to the forward board. Uh, and so uh, we have not gotten the forward board working yet, but uh, the aft power panel is energized and theoretically we can light up the aft of the ship. You guys had, this was a while ago, I forget the name of the guy that was kind of on loan from the Slater, but you had some really yeah. interesting videos of trying to restore, I think it was even just temporary power yeah. to the Sullivans. Yeah. Uh, what was that guy's name? You, you had like three or four videos uh, that were pretty interesting. Yeah, he's uh, this should be, you know, John. I don't want to uh, co op John, but it's uh, Barry Witty, who is uh, uh, an electrician, like the master electrician for the Slater. And we contacted him and he kind of helped. He came and then he's been guiding one of our volunteers remotely uh, when there's a problem. They, they get in communication with each other and then you know, Barry walks our volunteer through. So, yeah, it was, yeah it was and Barry, Barry is very experienced. He's uh, set up a basic uh, private consulting firm where he wants to help all museum ships now. Oh, interesting. Oh, really? Nice. Well, rent to Barry. Sounds, sounds like my kind of guy. <laughs> rent to Barry.com, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, and that's like I said, the videos were interesting. It's right after the, uh, the Sullivan's had pretty much been cleaned out if you will after mm -hmm. taking on water mm -hmm. and so you 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 basically followed him around and watched him connect a temporary power source to the panels now me as an engineer i found that pretty fascinating so if if those of you that are watching find those types of behind the scene videos uh, interesting as well like i do check out the buffalo naval parks youtube channel and you're going to see all kinds of stuff like that shortly after the sullivan uh, was was cleaned out, getting things restored like power and light. So um, definitely check that out. And as I always say, and we're going to get to John up in a little bit, but as I always say, one of the best ways to support operations like the kid, like the Cass and Young, we'll talk to Connor about the Alexander Henry, um, the Slater, Buffalo Naval Park, just check out their YouTube channel and subscribe. It's, it's one of the easiest yet most effective ways to throw support behind what they're trying to do over there. So check out their content that they're always posting get on facebook as well become a follower on facebook be a subscriber on youtube again one of the most effective ways to throw support behind those guys so uh, i strongly encourage you to check it out and moving over to the slater john epp what is uh coming up for the slater uh yeah so looking at that picture of the slater in the background there there's rust everywhere uh, <laughs> what a rust bucket just, just rust 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 um mm -hmm. well speaking of rust uh one of our projects going on now with our uh, restoration crew the um ready service lockers for the three inch on mount 33 has um seen better days so they're actually um going to be taking those out and doing a complete mm -hmm. all of those so it's a big mm -hmm. project they actually cut a, uh, they, they cut a hole in the uh, the gun tub to get it in and out. They have a, mm. Trying to get a little um, pulley system going for it. Um, general work on the ship is always painting going on. We just painted the port uh, weather deck last week, week before. I don't quite remember. Uh, over the weekend, we hosted a delegation from Nijmegen, Netherlands. What? Uh, Albany is the sister city of Nijmegen. 
<clears throat> really? Uh, after the I war. know all about Nijmegen, part of the uh, um, the um, Thirty Corps campaign to uh, cross all the bridges. I know Brooke yep. fight. Huh. Well, that's um, interesting. After the war ended, um, basically the, the citizens of Albany heard about the dire situation in terms of food scarcity in the Netherlands. And so they, they did uh, multiple uh, food drives and fundraisers and sent things over. And in uh, to show their gratitude, the Dutch then sent Albany uh, tulip bulbs. And, uh, they planted tulips throughout the city. And every year, last weekend, there's a huge festival called Tulip Fest. And so a delegation from Nijmegen came uh, last Saturday. We had a nice breakfast on the ship uh, because we actually did give some uh, destroy escorts to the Netherlands after the war. So there is a connection. Um, what else is going on? Uh, Dessa, like I said at the, the start of the show, final reunion of Dessa, which is the Destroy Escort Sales Association, our parent organization. They were the ones who actually got the Slater and brought it back to the U.S. They're shutting their doors down. Uh, their membership is dwindling. Uh, so they're going to hold a final reunion here aboard the ship. In just a couple of weeks, mm. June 16th to the 18th, I believe it is. Uh, so we're preparing for that. Um, like I say, every show, we're, we got Hensa as well in September. So uh -huh. um, Shan has been working on all that stuff as well. Uh, our new shoreside facility, our new gift shop is up and running. Wow. Yeah. Ba nice. Barry Whitty, if you want to if you want to come down and meet him, he's here on Saturdays. He's been <laughs> Installing uh, a lot of the security cameras and whatnot. Oh wow, that's he does that too. Huh? That's it. Oh, if there's electricity involved, he is doing it. Yes. Yeah. So that's uh, John Epp, curator of the USS Slater in Albany, New York. Definitely check out the the Facebook page. Like I said earlier, there's always updates um, talking about what the volunteers are doing. Um, Connor had the website up there, USSSlater.org. And of course, the YouTube channel, simply search for USS Slater. Um, well over 2,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel and good content there as well. And then finally, we're going to drag Connor on board real quick because um, I appreciate him putting up all the web addresses and, and highlighting uh, everyone's comments tonight. So Connor, definitely appreciate your help. Connor, of course, a uh, volunteer, new volunteer at the Alexander Henry. He's the one that was behind the scenes pulling the levers and spinning the dials uh, with all your questions and comments. Um, recently, just today, they announced that they're rebranding the whole operation and you can check them out at www.tmtb.ca. Connor, anything that you wanted to add for the Alexander Henry? Uh, yes, uh, just quickly, we do also have a new Facebook page. It's called Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay. I know John's already there, but just saying that we do have, and we're going to be adding Instagram and stuff soon as well. Uh, but yeah, that's basically. Here, wait a second. Let me let me in interrupt you real quick. So for Facebook, it's transportation. Uh, the Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay. Got it. Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay on Facebook. Yeah. Okay. And uh, sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. No problem. Uh, and yeah, Instagram and stuff. And we're roughly just under a week now. It's next Wednesday that we open finally to the public because uh, ice is finally melted. Uh, <laughs> ice is finally <laughs> melted. It, no joke. It only melted like three weeks ago. I, yeah, like, no, I believe it. Yeah. Hey, Parks, has the ice melted around the kid yet? You know, I am so jealous of the Northern Brothers to get to shut down for months at a time and do some serious work on the ship while we stay open every single day. Uh, you can and to answer things. your question, the ice in my cooler melted on the raft, yes. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. all right. So the, the, the ice in Tim's cooler melted and the ice around the Alexander Henry has melted up in Thunder Bay. Yeah. All right. And, and the iceberg uh, that sank Titanic, I don't know where it is today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, She's yeah. in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but yes, we'll be opening on Wednesday. And uh, just briefly, if you look up in the news as well, uh, we're actually going to be doing a dockside market uh, starting on June 5th. Uh, Thunder Bay is one of the sites for the Great Lakes cruise ships, which are coming into the Great Lakes, uh, most notably the Viking, Octantis, and Polaris. 
and I, not I, but we are going to be hosting a dockside market because unfortunately, just simply due to construction in the city this year, a lot of our downtown core in the north side has been basically cut off to people from uh, the, the cruise ship dock. So we're giving local uh, merchants an opportunity to uh, essentially show their stuff right next to the cruise ship. Uh, I believe I sent you the picture, uh, Ken, but I'm not sure if it's there. But of the, uh, of the cruise ship? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, the, uh, the Autantic docks less than 20 feet from our stern. So it's a, it's a good opportunity uh, for these vendors to sell their merchandise on our property, and it also helps the community. So that's something we'll be doing for this entire summer whenever the cruise ship is in town. Uh, I want to pull this picture up. There it is. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Uh, so where the Alexander Henry is, this is right behind it uh, often. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, and yeah very you nice. Of, it's one of the Viking ships, you know, because the bow kind of slopes backwards and mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's yeah. about the only thing in the harbor that has a thicker hull than we have. <laughs> than the Alexander Henry? Yeah, because that thing goes into the Arctic oh, in no the winter. Kidding. Wow. Yeah. Or Antarctic, actually, but yeah. Wow. Pretty wow. cool. Pretty cool. So uh, for the uh, Alexander Henry, like I uh, like we had said earlier, they had just uh, announced rebranding today. Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay, www.tmtb.ca. Um, okay. That is pretty much it from museum ship mafia anything else that uh you guys want to add you got anything going on do i have anything going on <laughs> yeah great question uh, <laughs> uh no just keep posting videos uh if you're interested in how a b-25 bomber did land on a world war ii aircraft oh, carrier oh, yeah. check out uh the history x youtube channel just get on youtube and search for history x channel and also posted a video uh, last night around this time about the Titanic and the 3D scan that everyone wants to interview Parks about. That's already at like 45,000 views. So that thing is taken off. So, <laughs> good for uh, you. Good for you. Get yeah. One good night of sleep and I'll answer people's questions. <laughs> yeah, Par <laughs> yeah, Parks does look a little exhausted. He's been busy uh, talking about the Titanic. Um, hey, uh, Connor, would you put up the photo that I just put? Up there. Um, I'm just. How do I add a picture to the reel? Uh, oh yeah. Uh, if you go to uh, do you see present at the bottom there? Uh, where? Uh, do you see present the little plus sign? Oh yeah, I see it. You should be able to click on that and pull up whatever you want. Okay. So this so is a lesson for all museum ships. <laughs> oh, okay. Hold on. Add a foe. Okay, upload a file. Um, just give me a second here. Yeah, take your time. You can, it should give you an option to share a screen too. So this is a picture, if he gets it up, of something I discovered today, late in the day when I went to go board the ship to take the Greek flag down. Okay. I discovered something. Ah. All right, hold on a second. <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go. I'm okay, afraid. share screen for a second. Connor and John are the youngest ones here, so they should be able to figure this out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hold on. There it is. No, that's not. Should it. I be afraid, Parks? There we go. Okay, we so I came and yeah, found that the, the the watch aboard the ship had forgotten that uh, Huckleberry Finn and Jim were on a raft <laughs> alongside. <laughs> <laughs> and left for the day, stranding these two. <laughs> oh my god! Over the side. Oh so my god! We had anyway, a backup plan. We'll be. We'll be. We could swim, right? We'll be yeah. trying to do our watch standards tomorrow. Don't forget the barge <laughs> alongside. Well, wait a second. Isn't there a rope ladder hanging down that I see at the bottom of the picture? So they. This they is this dead. is after I, I I had lowered a rope down to him. So oh, they wow. Got no, oh, no, no! You oh, didn't lower the rat, the ladder. That was our backup. Plan. No, I said lower the rope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you could get back to the Jacob's <laughs> ladder. Yes. Yeah. Uh, nice. So they were, 
So, okay. So this is, this is the barge that Tim was telling us before we started tonight. He was kind of explaining off screen, uh, or I'm sorry, before the live started. So it's a barge with scaffolding and what you do now that there's water again around the ship, you can float around and this is how you paint the hull. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. We we're using the exact same system on Henry. Uh, we have a, a pontoon barge that will be pulling along the side and doing paint work this year. Yep. Yep. Jeez. And that barge was redecked courtesy of a donation from one of our longtime employees and volunteers and, and donors, James Landry, just okay. to give him a shout out. So is that CV six six one? Is that what that is? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, we call that the Adventure Galley, which was um, Captain Kidd's ship, hmm. uh, pirate ship. Well, Excellent. and uh, so we'll we'll wrap this up. Like I always say, apologies to Ryan Szymanski at the Battleship <laughs> New Jersey for not being able to fit him in this evening. <laughs> We just ran long, mm -hmm. so we'll try and get him in some other time. Uh, appreciate his patience. And for audio versions of the uh, Museum Ship Mafia hey, podcast, you can definitely check out Museum Ship Mafia or search for Museum Ship Mafia on your favorite podcast platform. Any finals, final goodbyes, guys? Apologies to Rob for, for getting getting silenced for whatever reason yeah that was my fault i was trying to uh bring it up but i accidentally hit something else instead oh, blocked. oh. <laughs> uh that's my dad by the way he's watching tonight <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> oh nice. yeah I, yeah i've met rob uh he, he was in that picture uh earlier um yeah yeah he's <laughs> so what you're saying is you'll pay for that later yeah <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah if you if you find it ken it's What's that? Uh, no, my dad actually appeared in one of those slides. Yeah, he was actually wearing the History X hat during our press conference. Oh, nice. After. Yeah, unfortunately, I think I'm past that picture, but definitely always appreciate it. Well, let's yeah. see. Uh, we'll wrap We'll wrap this up. Thanks, guys, for uh, tuning in tonight. Everyone tuning in tonight for the 80th anniversary, commemorating the 80th anniversary of the um, – not the launching. Parks corrected me. That's not the right word. It's the commissioning. The commissioning. commissioning. commissioning of the USS Charette HS Velos. Um, and for the next um, episode of Museum Ship Mafia, we always try and do that on the second Wednesday of every month. So when it comes to June, pay attention for posts. Uh, it'll be the second Wednesday in June. If there isn't anything else, I'll just say my name is Ken Stano from the YouTube channel History X, check out uh, historyxchannel.com. Thank you, everybody, and hope you all have a great evening. Night. Night.